here I was aging gracefully and then you had to throw some watermelon seeds into my oatmeal and now it messed up everything. I'll make you feel a little bit better. We are all messing up our aging, right? Because we don't really know everything there is to know about it. We know the tip of the iceberg, but based upon the tip of the iceberg that we do know, we can come up with a few things we probably should start avoiding if we want to, I don't know, improve sort of our, I don't know, healthy longevity or healthy aging. So let's go ahead and let's take a look. I'll jump right into it. The first one is reducing our carbohydrate intake, okay? I know it sounds very generic, but let me explain the biochemistry here. I'm not suggesting that everyone goes out and does a ketogenic diet. That is not what I'm saying at all. Okay, the issue we have when it comes down to aging and longevity has to do with the overconsumption of carbohydrates. Okay, if you look at where we end up getting longevity benefit, a lot of it has to do with what is called nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide. Okay, so it's NAD. Now it's the job of NAD to grab electrons and bring them into the cell to ultimately create energy. Well, it's also the job of NAD to go out and activate pro-longevity genes like sirtuins and assist in some degree with what is called FOXO. Now, I'm going to make this simple. I'm not going to go into heavy bioenergetics and, and that whole piece. The bottom line is that when we consume carbohydrates, glucose requires a good amount of this NAD. Okay, glucose is just, it's a greedy little sucker. And when we consume a lot of carbohydrates, it takes up a lot of that NAD because it is required for that to get into the cell. When we reduce our glucose intake, we leave more NAD available. Now, when you look at a lot of the aging research, you see caloric restriction is very, very powerful. Now, the primary reason that caloric restriction is so powerful with aging is because you are freeing up more NAD. Less NAD is being occupied shuttling energy into the cell, leaving it more available to go activate what are called sirtuins. When they activate these sirtuins, it triggers in a cascade of different anti-inflammatory and different pro-longevity systems within the body. Very, very important. Now, when you look at the ketogenic diet, it's easy to say the ketogenic diet is good for longevity, and in a lot of ways it is, but the real reason is it's more about the reduction of the carbohydrate intake. Okay, so if we can just consciously reduce the carbohydrates that we're taking in, and I don't care how you get there, more protein, more fat, more veggies, I don't really care. Just reducing that glucose intake makes a huge difference in our potential aging and how we age. But the other piece is something called FOXO, which is becoming increasingly popular in the aging research world. Okay, glucose inhibits the expression of this very valuable FOXO. So FOXO is known as like the pro-longevity gene. Okay, when it gets expressed, it triggers autophagy, cellular recycling, it triggers anti-inflammatory measures within the body, and a lot of other just very important things related to telomeres and aging in general. So what happens when we consume a bunch of glucose? When we consume glucose, it spikes our insulin. When our insulin spikes, it binds to a receptor. And when it binds to that receptor, it sends a signal that phosphorylates FOXO. What does that mean? Well, it means that it changes the structure. It means a phosphate molecule binds to it. So it phosphorylates this FOXO. Then when the FOXO is trying to get into the cell and go to the nucleus, it cannot because a phosphorylated FOXO cannot fit into the cell, so it never gets expressed. So the pro-longevity genes never get activated because they're bound by phosphate, they're phosphorylated, as a result of excess glucose. So what am I saying here? Yeah, the modulation of glucose intake is pivotal, absolutely pivotal, okay? And if you start looking at the research, you will see it. Anyway, moving into number two, not getting enough avocado oil, and especially olive oil. Okay, these are monounsaturated Mediterranean fats that are so valuable when it comes down to different aging processes within our body. The biggest piece that I have to talk about is lipid peroxidation. We're getting all the wrong fats and we should be substituting them with these high quality Mediterranean style fats. When we consume a bunch of soybean oil, canola oil, uh, sunflower oil, all these different omega-6 oils that are in just about every processed food that we consume, we have a lot of what is called lipid peroxidation. Okay, when we have lipid peroxidation, we create a lot of ROS, reactive oxygen species, at a cellular level, at sort of a fat level. Well, this reactive oxygen species does a couple of things. One, it's a hallmark of aging, having a lot of ROS, but additionally, higher levels of oxidative stress are gonna result in what is called an increase in what is called HIF 
one, okay? Hypoxia inducible factor one. What this HIF-1 does is it deactivates or downregulates pyruvate dehydrogenase, which allows us to use glucose. So what am I getting at here? What I'm saying is that all the consumption of the poor quality fats that we are consuming right now is directly affecting our ability to process glucose and metabolize fuel efficiently, leading to an increase in reactive oxygen species and sort of a, the downturn of our ability to process carbs in the future which definitely is not good. That's gonna to lead to hyperinsulinemia, it's gonna to lead to all kinds of problems there. But if you implement olive oil, you implement avocado oil, but mainly olive oil as a result of just the hydroxytyrosol and different uh, antioxidants that are in it, okay, that is very active. And what I mean by that is there is a component of olive oil called oleic acid that converts into OEA, which stands for oleolethanolamine, which is a mouthful. And what that oleolethanolamine or OEA does is it increases what are called uncoupling proteins. These uncoupling proteins sit on the membrane right where hydrogen is passing through a turbine in our cell, creating energy. What that does is it steals some of the energy and dissipates it as heat. So this process is so important because it forces our body to elevate metabolism. Okay, we want an elevated metabolism because it's keeping our cells functioning, it's keeping things working, it's keeping just cellular function at its best. This can play a big role in what's called mitochondrial biogenesis, the ability of the mitochondria to increase mass, produce more energy. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, yeah, I think we all want a little bit more energy. Olive oil is so important. And then you factor in the hydroxytyrosol, which is an antioxidant that's in olive oil. It's very, very important. Okay, not all olive oil is created equal. I've talked about this company before, but there's a company that I linked down below called Fresh Pressed Olive Oil Club. Okay, they will ship really high quality olive oils directly to your doorstep. So they get their olive oil from the top 2% of the farms in the world. Okay, so really we're talking top ranked award winning olive oil farms, olive farms. And then they ship it right to your doorstep, free shipping as well. And they air ship it, so it's really quick. So right after it's harvested, you're getting it. That's super, super, super important because olive oil is fragile. So if you're wanting the benefits of it, you really do need to get it when it's not rancid, when it's actually really fresh. So I put a link down below because they've supported this channel with a couple of other videos before and they are a sponsor on this channel and they're who I use. So if you want to check them out, there is a link down below. Again, it's free shipping. That is absolutely the olive oil that I would recommend. If you can get your hands on it, you can catch it during the harvest or shortly right after the harvest, then you get a lot of benefit out of that. So I would definitely recommend going that route. So again, link is down below and thank you Fresh Pressed Olive Oil Club for continuing to support this channel, but also giving my viewers what they need. So that link is down below. The next one is a very interesting cutting edge piece and that is called microbiome uniqueness, okay? But people are making mistakes in the world of doing things that damage their microbiome. And this isn't gonna be generic. This is pretty intense stuff. There's a study that was published in the journal Nature Metabolism and that was pretty fascinating because it looked at something called microbiome uniqueness. Okay, they found that as people got older, it was less about diversity. Diversity was still important, but more about uniqueness. And what that means is how your microbiome is different from my microbiome and how my microbiome is different from Bob's and Bob's is different from Jane's and Jane's is different from Barbara's. They're all different and that uniqueness is a good measurement of longevity. Why is that? Because as we get older, we don't necessarily want the same blanket diverse microbiome. We wanna see uniqueness because that indicates an adaptive microbiome that is adjusting and compensating for whatever is going on in an aging body. So if you have XYZ going on, you want a microbiome that is shifting and modulating towards whatever XYZ is going on. If I have XYZ or ABC going on, I want a microbiome that is unique to me to compensate for my issues, right? Point is, is uniqueness becomes more important as we get older. So we actually look at that difference. People that had very similar microbiomes tended to not do as well with longevity. So how are we damaging our microbiome? Well, interesting study published in the journal Microorganisms found that sodium benzoates, potassium sorbates, and sodium nitrites had this huge effect on gut dysbiosis. Okay, they harmed a lot of our bacteria but also found they triggered an increase in proteobacteria, which is largely associated with poor glucose tolerance and also just associated with other negative health markers in general. But that's not it. Let's dive into artificial sweeteners. I think that is a huge mistake we are making. I'm not talking about stevia, monk fruit. I'm talking about like saccharin and heavy use of sucralose and things like that. So there's a study published in the journal Advances in Nutrition that found that saccharin and sucralose led to, of course, a dysbiosis, which is not a huge surprise, but even more so some glucose tolerance issues. 
as we get older, we already have glucose tolerance issues. Okay, we already have a decrease in pyruvate dehydrogenase. The last thing we need to do is impact it more with some microbiome shift, right? So we really need to be paying attention to that. If we have less glucose tolerance, we have less mitochondrial biogenesis going on because we have less demand to utilize glucose. So you don't use it, you lose it. And then lastly, emulsifiers. Okay, so watch out for any kind of emulsifiers that can break down that gut mucosal layer, which definitely can have an effect there. Then moving into the next category is not mitigating our cortisol properly. Now, that's a blanket statement. I wish that we could all just sit here and say, I don't wanna be stressed out anymore and magically make it go away. Way easier said than done. Okay, but cortisol is not designed to be chronically elevated. If you look at subjects with what's called Cushing's disease, where they have chronically high levels of cortisol, they have higher levels of visceral fat, they have all kinds of other systemic issues going on. Okay, we're designed to have these short, quick, acute bouts of stress, not chronic. So the journal Frontiers in Physiology published something super interesting, at least to me, found that when cortisol levels were elevated, it stimulated hepatic gluconeogenesis. So basically made the liver create more carbohydrates from other substrates, which is a pretty common response when we're fasting or stressed out or anything like that. The problem is, if it's chronically high, it has to have a carbon source. The liver has to create glucose or carbohydrates from a carbon source. A carbohydrate, just by molecular makeup, is carbon hydrogen, right? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. So we need that carbon. Well, where's it gonna get it? It's gonna pull it from our muscle tissue. That's the best, most efficient, effective, readily available source of carbon. So when we're chronically stressed out, we are absolutely wasting muscle. And as we get older, not only is this important, but it also affects how we age because our muscles are secretary organs. Like it's not just about moving your body, it actually sends signals, and the more muscle we lose, the less metabolically active we are, and the worse our metabolism is, and ultimately the worse our aging becomes. But then there is a study published in the journal Biophysica Acta that found that visceral fat and cortisol are interlinked as well. Those that had higher levels of cortisol had more visceral fat. Why is that? Well, visceral fat has more glucocorticoid receptors. That means that your visceral fat will receive cortisol, and cortisol is very adipogenic, meaning it stimulates fat accumulation. So when you have more glucocorticoid receptors in your visceral fat, which is your belly fat, it's gonna pull it in there, it's gonna attract the cortisol, and that's gonna say, hey, 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 store more, store more. So it stimulates more storage of visceral fat. And then I don't need to go down the rabbit hole of what visceral fat does, but visceral fat leaks inflammatory cytokines. It's the job of visceral fat to trigger inflammation to protect that particular area. But when we have so much, it's cascading throughout our body and that's sending an inflammatory signal throughout our body, which is definitely associated with aging. We don't want that. Then the last piece is one that you might not find super interesting, but it's probably one of the most important. We start looking at the newer research. We realize that as a society, we are becoming less and less and less community driven. Community is a huge driver for healthy aging. And there's a lot of research to back it up. And in a world where we are in a digital age where people are getting more and more isolated, we are losing not only the microbiome effect of a community, but also the serotonin, the dopamine, the overall neurotransmitter and hormonal effect of being around a community. When you look at seniors that are in senior homes and you query them and you look at the overall breakdown, you notice that when they start going into homes and they're isolated, their quality of health just diminishes, right? Okay, same kind of thing over the past year with a lot of isolation. Okay, a study out of the UK demonstrated that even kids that are like 16 to 24, 40% of them describe themselves as being somewhat depressed and lonely. That is going to have a trickle effect on not only our microbiome, but our metabolism and everything else as far as neurotransmitters. So it's important we do not forget that one of the hallmarks of really staying youthful is about community. And I know that's not what this channel is about, but it's probably the most important message you'll get out of this video. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. Don't forget to check out Fresh Pressed Olive Oil Club down below in the description. I'll see you tomorrow.